Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. I am your host today, Matthew Johnson, where we meet with Hawaii's farmers, foodies, and everyone who cares about Hawaii local food uh, industry. Uh, as always, you can join the conversation by tweeting in at, at thinktechhi, and you can also join the conversation by calling in on the hotline at 808-374-2014. As always, we have super exciting guests on the show, and with me today, we have Chuck Wakeman with Butcher and Bird. Uh, it's going to be Honolulu's hottest new butchery, and same with Chuck. So, Chuck, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so, yeah, you and I met uh, probably a couple months ago. You've been working out of the uh, food hub in Kalihi. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, Butcher and Bird. Uh, Butcher and Bird is going to be uh, a local full-service butcher in Delhi. Uh, full-service meaning everything will be freshly displayed in a meat case. Uh, you come to the counter, you interact with the butcher, uh, you can request special cut items, uh, things that you can't find in big box stores because we're utilizing whole animal, which gives us all the cuts you can imagine. Um, also with that, we'll be doing our own fresh sausages. Uh, we're building out a 40-foot cure room to cure our own charcuterie, so salamis, chorizo, prosciutto, the whole gambit there. And uh, we'll also be doing lunch service 11 to 3 daily uh, with sandwiches and sausages and, and the like. Wow, so I definitely know that there's been places that have spoken about or even tried to do this concept before, but this is really going to be kind of, I mean, at least as I know, on the island of Oahu, one of the first uh, type full service butchery like you're talking about. Is that correct? Definitely the first one in a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I talked to a lot of the older generation and they always remember, you know, yeah. oh, my mom would go down to the butcher and, and get our cuts on a Sunday and things like that. So I think it's just been a while since that's been here. Mm -hmm. um, and... I think the challenge has been that I've seen in the past is a lot of chefs will um, get interested in uh, being a butcher and they'll try that approach to be a butcher. Uh, for me, I was an apprentice and came through to a journeyman in a meat program. Okay. So I understand the uh, retail side of, of butchering. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think gives me a, a bit of a leg up. Mm -hmm. And then I did spend time in kitchens cooking uh, which added to uh, my skill set, and now I'm kind of able to bring that all together to where I do have, you know, fresh meats and sausages, but also am able to, you know, compose dishes and plates mm. to be able to have an outlet to, to sell my food as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like you had mentioned me, to me before, there's a difference between being a butcher and then there's also just people who are a proportioner, where it's kind of like how right. you break apart enamel, where mm -hmm. there's definitely more of a a craft and an art to, to what you're doing that maybe yeah. people don't have as much of an appreciation for. Absolutely. And uh, a lot of that, you know, it's, it's meat cutter versus butcher. Yeah. Um, a meat cutter, for the most part, things will come in uh, boneless. Uh, you know, it's called a subprimal, where it's, it's a smaller piece where they are. They're taking their, and they're portioning steaks for a counter or packaging mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, which this makes sense. This might be what you can get at, like, Safeway exactly. or even Whole Foods. Right. Which as a business model for a big store like that, it makes mm -hmm. sense because if you think about uh, cubic footage, which is what everything comes in here, yeah. cubic footage, right? Uh, if you hang a side of beef in a refrigerated box versus 10 cases of ribeyes, you're paying for so much more potential if you're buying you know, the boxed beef, right, right? right? So a lot of that skill has been lost for the whole animal butchery and understanding uh, how to extract all the cuts and how to cost them properly to where you're selling them and making the proper margins to keep the product flowing, essentially, yeah. Because yeah. hey, you were talking about before where, you know, because you really have to utilize a full animal, especially mm -hmm. if you're going to be, and, and that's one of the great things about what you're doing is you're going to be using uh, local, local animals as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So you were kind of talking about, like, the different types of cuts that you have to do and really how to utilize as much of the animal as possible. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that, where you know people are obviously familiar with the steaks or the right. uh, hams or, or whatnot. You know, talk about some of the, the, the different things that you know, you're talking about adding value to different parts of the sure. 
uh, of the animal. Talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, sausage is definitely the biggest outlet for a value-added product, mm -hmm. right? Uh, every time you break down an animal, you end up with lots of trimming. Uh, that necessarily can't be used for you know stew or you know, steaks or you know, different cuts. Yeah. Um, basically, you take that, you grind it, mm -hmm. um, you go through a sausage making technique, emulsifying, adding seasonings, stuffing it in a casing, uh, and you make it into something that uh, is not only perceived value; it's a value. People love sausage. Yeah. So knowing how to make sausage or even like charcuterie and things like that gives you an outlet for some of the off cuts that are normally just sold as, you know, ground pork or ground beef, yeah, yeah, yeah. which helps you with your margin mix. So talk a little bit about, like, I, I, I mean, I think even for myself, I think people are familiar with the term charcuterie, but really what, what is that and what what is your charcuterie going to look like? Right, so charcuterie encompasses a, a lot of, of different uh, aspects. The one that we're going to focus, be focusing on is, is dry carrying meats. So, um, you know, hundreds of years ago when people wanted to preserve meat, mm -hmm. they would salt it. Uh, they would hang it in caves where the environment is usually around 62 degrees and mm -hmm. uh, you know, pretty low humidity. And over time, you, know, you suck out water, uh, you control temperature. You're creating an environment where the meat can dry out but not spoil, mm -hmm. uh, something that's not conducive to bad bacterial growth. The side product or byproduct of that is it makes for a really delicious product. You know, the, the flavors change. You get uh, certain molds that grow on the meat that, mm -hmm. that give it almost like that blue cheesy flavor. So that's like kind of like the, the almost like the crusting, the, the casing yeah. around the meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll see that white like uh, like fuzz almost on the outside, but yeah. it's, it's mold. Yeah. And uh, but it's good mold. Yeah. yeah and yeah. so that's a flavor profile that you can't just create. You can't go into a lab and you know, mix something up and add it to meat and like, oh, this tastes like salami. Yeah, it's yeah. something that takes time and, uh, and skill to create those flavors. Huh. Mm -hmm. so, so obviously you don't have a, a cave that you're using. Mm -hmm. um, so talk about, so you're, you're going to be opening up uh, Butcher and Bird. So it's a, it's a new, like you said, full service uh, butchery mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be located in Kaka'ako. Talk a little bit about the actual space itself. Yeah, so, um, well, off the charcuterie uh, subject, mm. right when you walk in, there's going to be a 40-foot cure room, which okay. is basically a you know, temperature and humidity-controlled box. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to cut a 3 by 3 viewing window, so when you walk in, you can oh, see cool. all the different salamis and things hanging in there. Yeah. Um, after that, you'll, you'll pass that. It'll come into uh, a deli display case with all our different uh, cheeses, meats, and breads, yeah. uh, the charcuterie side. Uh, then there'll be a eight foot fresh case with all the pork, lamb, beef, uh, fresh sausage. And behind that, you'll be able to see uh, all the production going on. You'll see the bandsaw, uh, you know, grinders and, and all these old school butcher shop things that you don't really see much of anymore. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll be back there cutting away and waiting for people to come in so I can greet them and, and you know, not only get them what they're asking for, maybe educating them to find things that they didn't even know they needed or wanted, you know? Right. Like, oh, I'm making a marinara sauce. Well, traditionally, a marinara sauce, you want to start with pork neck bones because huh. it gives a lot of collagen and body to the to okay. the sauce. So, hey, I've got pork neck bones. Why don't you start with these? And, you know, it's, it's a lot of education, I think, at the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, especially since there hasn't been something like this, like you said, in on Oahu in Hawaii for you know a really long time so mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of people you know like I was saying before like kind of have a general idea of what the concept may be like but until mm -hmm. they actually walk in there it's probably going to be you know you're probably going to be giving a lot of questions and kind of yeah uh, maybe some confused people when they first walk in yeah absolutely but for me that's one of the things I love about being you know in a full service butcher shop is is the exchange of ideas and People that shop there are usually pretty passionate about what they're doing, yeah. and uh, as am I. So yeah. when you get that flow, that exchange going on, to me, it's it's really fun, and and people get into it. You know, they, they oh, come yeah. back and they tell you like, oh man, I tried this; it was really really great. You know, yeah. here, why don't you try this next time? And you get the regulars coming through just because it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up uh, just outside of Philadelphia, so I remember going to the old Italian markets, and, mm -hmm. and I imagine it's going to have like a similar vibe to that, where you yeah, go totally. in and kind of. Pick out your meats, and you know, you're on a first name basis with your butcher. So mm -hmm. 
That's very exciting. So, um, uh, so the shop is going to be in Kaka'ako uh, at the Salt mm -hmm. um, area. So, um, yeah, talk a little bit about. So, uh, in this space, you're going to have the uh, the charcuterie room, the, mm -hmm. the viewing room. Uh, talk a little bit about what else, like what kind of products can someone expect to see, mm -hmm. and then um, we'll also then talk about where you're getting your supply of uh, products from. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, as well as the meats, we'll have pretty much everything that goes with meat. Uh, pickles, mustards, uh, fresh breads, um, all the things that you would want to take to a barbecue, let's say, or if you're going to make a stew, something like that. Yeah, so yeah. definitely meat-centric, but also I should touch on the fact that in the name Butcher and Bird, mm. uh, Bird is my is my wife's nickname. Okay. Um, so she she does aerial uh, burlesque and and she's on the silks and she's like flying around like a bird, right? Okay. So yeah. She has a little bit different diet than I do. Mm. <laughs> she is, uh, you know, very clean eater. Lots of veggies, a mm. uh, little bit of meat here and there. Mm. And what we notice is when her and I go out to places together, it's usually one or the other. Right. Like we're either at a vegan restaurant where I'm like. <laughs> or she's had like some meaty place yeah. where she's going. Uh, so we wanted to have that dichotomy of a place where anybody can can come together and and eat. So we'll have a, a bird side of the menu too, where it's going to okay. be you know roasted vegetables and oh, wow. and salads and, and things like that. So that's the other side that you're going to be able to find there. It's not just meat. Yeah, I mean, if it was up to me, it'd be. But <laughs> <laughs> no, there's there's lots of of other things going on there as well. Well, I mean, I think it's a great idea, other than the fact to, you know, appease your wife so she'll come yeah, right. and hang out with you at work as well and maybe help out. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, diets are changing and people mm -hmm. are looking for more mixture of, of foods. Mm -hmm. And I think you might have a, a combination of maybe people that had been uh, anti-meat before because, you know, the traditional uh, large meat industry does have a lot of uh, issues with it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the fact that you're kind of going this small scale, uh, locally sourced mm -hmm. meats where it's like, hey, you know your butcher, you know, and having those conversations about, you know, about the meat, where did it come from? How was it prepared? Right. Um, more of that, that background, which I think is really what people are looking for. Oh, for sure. Um, so you may even get some, some converts of um, it may be people that you know, were kind of anti-meat, but kind of learning your story and kind of um, yeah, learning more about the whole process you right. know, might, might be willing to try it out again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And also, too, you know, um, we just took a trip to Portland about a month ago, and it was great because the restaurants that we went to there, um, you know, usually when she starts rattling off her, her allergies or okay. her restrictions, mm. it's... It's uncomfortable sometimes because she feels like uh, she's asking the kitchen to do something that might be, you know, difficult or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I've always told her, I say, you know, any kitchen worth its salt should be able to come up with a nice vegetable dish or mm -hmm. something like that on the fly uh, because that means they're cooking things fresh, right? Yeah. And so importantly, we notice, you know, she would give them their allergies. They'd have like four or five different menus. Oh, you know, nightshades and this and that. Well, here's a menu for you. You can order anything off this menu. So we really want to be uh, as accommodating as possible. Yeah. So anybody can come in there and, and have something to eat. Cool. Um, so unfortunately, yeah, we've got to take a quick break. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll be back in about uh, one minute, and we'll talk more about your background. I want to hear kind of like, how did you fall into this? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Hey, aloha, Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii, uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on Think Tech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value 
the accomplishments and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. And welcome back to White Food and Farmer Series. I'm your host today, Matthew Johnson, where we're talking with Chuck Wakeman with Butcher and Bird. And uh, yeah, talking about uh, Hawaii's newest uh, full service um, butchery. And uh, so yeah, we're kind of talking about the store that's gonna be opening up in Kaka'ako at uh, Salt. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yeah, before I forget, why don't I do a plug for the store? Uh, when, you know, when's the, the opening gonna be happening? Uh, we're looking to open around April 15th. Okay. Um, so we're excited, we're building right now and, and things are coming together. It's, you know, it's the, the vision is, is coming together and it's really exciting to see. Yeah, uh, no, that's great. Um, so one of the things I wanna talk about is a little bit your, your background. So how, like uh, you mentioned before that you had uh, working at the Whole Ox before, mm -hmm. which also used to be uh, in Kaka'ako. That's right. Um, yeah, how did you get into uh, slaughtering and breaking apart <laughs> animals? What, what's, what happened? <laughs> um, well, if I would have started that at age five, they probably would have profiled me as, as yeah. some sort of weirdo. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. fortunately for me, um, it happened when I moved to Chicago at about age 24. Okay. Um, I moved there with literally $40 in my pocket, mm. um, not a lot of prospects. I loved the city. I, I just wanted to be there for some reason. And, Where did you uh, grow up? I grew up uh, in the Bay Area okay. through Pennsylvania. Okay. And then you know, eventually ended up in Chicago. Mm. And so when I got there, it was just one of those things like, don't want to age myself too much, but I'm looking through the paper for a job, right? In the classifieds, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. circling them with the old red pen, you know? Yeah. And uh, I saw, I said, you know, a butcher, uh, you know, experience needed, you know, and I, that's, well, I'm pretty sure that's a union job. So at least if I get in here, you know, maybe I can get a trade and mm. something to start off on. And so I went down to the, the, the shop and it was just a local butcher shop in Lincoln Park in Chicago. And um, the owner was like, oh, you know, I'm kind of looking for somebody with experience. Mm. You know, sorry, and I, t I told him, I said, you know what, I, I don't have experience, but I'm young, uh, I'll work hard, you know, give me a shot, maybe mm -hmm. we can check it out. And he said, okay. He called me back, he said, come in, let's work for a couple weeks, see how, if it fits for you, and mm -hmm. you know, if it fits for us, and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And uh, I think pretty much right off the bat, I loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I always just say, it's making big rocks into little rocks, Okay. right? So they threw a slab of meat on the table, mm -hmm. and I have my tools in my hands, and you know, I, I, I take this and I break it down, break it down, and then it becomes this, and it looks beautiful, and I put it in a case, and I can see the process all the way through until it goes out the door, and yeah. it's gratification, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be in a shop where it was mostly old timers. Mm -hmm. There's a guy, he was about 62, the other guy was 70, he did it just because he still enjoyed it, yeah. and then the owner was about 45 years old, and he'd been doing it since he was 13 for his uncle, so wow. the knowledge in there was, insane yeah. and these guys kind of realize that there's not a lot of young people trying to learn the craft that yeah. they've already known so they wanted to dump as much knowledge as they could into me and wow. they really like they really trained me well they they showed me as much as they possibly could mm. and it was a, a shop where we still did whole animal butchery okay which I thought was just butchery I thought like everybody does it that way right so whole animal versus, I mean, is what you're going to do with your shop not going to be whole animal? Or no, what? it will. Oh, it'll, okay. It'll, it'll be whole animal. You always have to supplement some cuts because, you know, you're always going to sell a ton of steaks, right. like ribeyes and strips. Mm -hmm. So you would back up on everything else if you just did whole animal. Gotcha. So you do as much whole animal as possible and then supplement some of the cuts. Yeah. Um, when I left there and got a job at a grocery store in San Diego mm -hmm. uh, when I was moving, uh, I just saw boxes of beef and yeah. you know everything was already and I was well where's all the whole animals like where's the sides and yeah, where's yeah, the quarters yeah, yeah, yeah. well we don't do that huh. so that's when I realized how fortunate I was to have learned from the beginning like the really old school classic way of, of, of cutting meat yeah you almost had like the the fine dining part of, of butchery and then mm -hmm. you kind of went and worked at a, a fast food place and right you know wasn't wasn't going to be nearly as impressed with that yeah well, and the owner was a German sausage maker too, so that kind of helped. Okay. <laughs> so I got to learn. That's always a good thing. a German sausage maker. I was like, all right, yeah, this will be okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. 
Um, so, cool. So then, how'd you get to Hawaii? So Hawaii, uh, you know, came for vacation, mm. surfed without a wetsuit one time. Mm. So okay, this is the only way to do this. And, yeah. you know, the, the cold and all that, no, no more. So uh, moved here, and uh, you know, I was looking for a place to work as a butcher. Uh, I didn't want to work in a grocery store, mm. and I saw a uh, Adam Craigslist for at the Whole Ox, uh, where Bob McGee was uh, looking for a butcher, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so yeah, it sounds great. So I went down there and and uh, he gave me a shot and saw how I cut meat and was like, wow, yeah, <laughs> welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, after a while, I've I've always enjoyed cooking, um, and I decided I wanted to, to you know get on the hot line and start cooking yeah. at age thirty. You know, so, yeah, yeah. and I did. I jumped in and uh, got in way over my head and and learned a lot. Uh, I went and worked with Chris Kajoka at Vintage Cave for okay. a year and. I mean, I went from a, a burger cook to really high and fine dining, which yeah. was a massive learning curve, but learned a lot and uh, worked at Pig and the Lady as their butcher. But what I noticed is every kitchen I went into, um, my skills as a butcher were always way more unique than mm -hmm. another cook or a chef. Right. And, you know, after a while, I just kind of realized the cooking thing's fun and everything, but I kind of feel a responsibility to, to share my craft with other people. So. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, we'll talk talk a little bit about the your supply of product. Um, mm -hmm. Where where are you getting? Like what kind of? You mentioned some of the meats. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, pork, beef, uh, lamb, chicken. Um, I, I think probably a lot of people that maybe aren't in the industry don't really have an appreciation for the variety of different meats that that are available. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what you're going to have and where they're coming from? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Beef, uh, be using uh, Canoa Cattle Company. Mm -hmm. um, they recently opened a slaughterhouse in Kapolei. Mm -hmm. I think it was last March. Uh, and it's been a while since we've had a USDA approved functioning, you know, state of the art slaughterhouse. Yeah. Uh, so it's great, you know. Uh, they have their own brand, but they also bring in, you know, all meats from the islands that they can process there. So if I found something special and unique that I liked, you know, they would process it for me there and, and I could have it in the shop. Uh, as far as pork, uh, I'm going to be using Pono pork, uh, mm -hmm. which my old friend Bob McGee, he's, uh, he's, he's uh, facilitating that. Uh, they use pigs from Waianae, mm -hmm. um, Mountain View Dairy Farm. They use a Korean farming method, which is a, a really clean, great way to, to raise pigs. Uh, and also, I want to bring in pigs from Malama Farms on Maui, okay. which is... Uh, they use a Berkshire hog, yeah. which is kind of like the Wagyu of pork. Mm. I mean, it's it's really an amazing, amazing product. Uh, the fat on it is is uh, super soft and it just yeah. crisps up, and it's it's, it's a great product. So I'm going to bring that in. Uh, we can get lamb, uh, venison. Mm. Um, there's also another cattle company that I've been talking to in Kula on Maui that are actually doing some grain-finished uh, local beef. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can get plenty of grass-fed, grass-finished, which is a great option and people are into it. But I think it'd be fun to kind of check out maybe some of the grain-finished stuff too, just mm -hmm. to offer like a contrast in flavor yeah. profiles. Yeah. yeah. But there's a lot of, of ranchers and, and farmers out there that uh, they have the product, they just need an, an outlet. So yeah. that's what I want to provide. I'm sure, you know, the, your suppliers are getting very excited because Especially if it's because uh, I know that's one of the biggest challenges, like you mentioned, with you know, for traditionally, uh, if someone is raising a entire hog, you know, they, they've got an entire hog that they need to uh, sell and, and make something happen with. So if you're able to take that whole animal mm -hmm. off their hands, literally, that that'll be a huge benefit for them. Yeah, absolutely. And that's and uh, you know, in the past, the biggest outlet for a lot of the local ranchers and, and farmers has been through restaurants. Yeah. Which uh, it's a good way, I think, to get uh, recognition and, and get you know your brand out there and and uh, you know get feedback on flavor and that kind of thing. Uh, but a butcher shop will allow me to move more of their product mm. and utilize it in ways um, that sometimes restaurants they don't have the facilities to do, yeah. and they end up with a lot of offcuts that they're kind of like oh, I don't really know what to do with the. Know, the shanks and the feet and the, yeah. you know, the heads and stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, more about the actual shop. So you have an event coming up this weekend, yeah? Yeah, uh, this Saturday, 
Uh, Salt is doing a bar crawl and, and block party. Okay, so um, like St. Patty's Day. St. Patty's Day, Day yeah. Okay. So I made a uh, corned beef flavored sausage. Uh, it tastes just like corned beef. Yep. And we're going to put uh, cabbage and, and Guinness beer mustard on there and, and, uh, and uh, pickle and, and serve sausages to people drinking beer all night. It's going to yeah. be like a backyard barbecue pretty much. You know? That sounds perfect. Uh, I'm definitely going to be down there and I'll be one of those guys drinking beer. Come awesome. <laughs> um, so then talk about, um, I guess, some of like what your, your future plans. I mean, obviously, you know, this is uh, a big step for you, mm -hmm. you know, creating your own shop. But kind of talking about the the meat industry in Hawaii as a whole, where you know hopefully this is going to be a great uh, initial outlet um, that makes it a little bit easier for you know some of the ranchers and some of the other uh, meat producers. But what do you? I mean, what else do you think? Where do you think this is all going? Do you think um, do you have potentially plans for uh, additional shops or mm -hmm. you know? I'm sure you've been kind of thinking about this because the space you're going to have is relatively small. Right. I think you said 1,500 square feet. Mm -hmm. About that, yeah. Um, but what are kind of things do you think can can be done either by you or other groups out there? Yeah. What I've noticed um, is. Consistency is something that I've had that I've struggled with with some of the the, um, the the producers, and and it's not any individual producer. It's usually there's like a conglomerate, right, that you're going to buy yeah. uh, your product through. I, mean, you know, I won't name names, but I've used ones in the past where you know one week you get something from you know this ranch yeah. and it's great, and then the next week you get it from a different ranch in the in the okay. conglomerate and it's eh. Mm. And then it's good, and it's you know it's it's up and down. Yeah. Um, so I would love it to love to see just more collaboration mm. within these different conglomerates to where they start kind of standardizing things. Mm -hmm. You know, the breed, the feed, you know, the gestation period. How long are they growing for? When you're harvesting them, all that kind of stuff. Just to see a little bit more consistent product. Yeah. Um, I think I'll be able to help with some of that. Uh, as far as, you know, like the guys at Canola Cattle Company, they, mm -hmm. they trust my opinion about things. Yeah. Uh, when I first went out and met them, they say, oh, here, come in our coolers and check out the, the meat in here and, you know, let, let me know what you think about the fat on the animals and the intramuscular fat. And, uh, you know, for me, I have enough experience and knowledge where I can tell them, like, oh, yeah, like, this feels a little loose, you know, the, the flesh is a little off or something and this okay. and that. And they're real receptive. They want to produce the best product they can as well. Mm -hmm. So it's good, I think, for there to be somebody at the end of the chain, which is me, sending feedback back up through the chain yeah. and hopefully affecting some uh, some differences, you know? Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. But Chuck, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, I know I learned a lot about just what it takes to open up a, a butcher shop. Mm -hmm. And so good luck yeah, with the you. venture. I'm excited to come by and check it out. Definitely be coming by um, this Saturday to see your uh, pop-up. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, so thank you for joining us, Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. We're here every other Thursday, and we'll see you in two weeks. Aloha.